this morning. Welcome to you all for our travel talk. Um, Carol has very kindly agreed to give the talk this morning. She's done two, I think maybe three talks for us at the Outer Education College in Leicester. And uh, we've enjoyed them very much. And we're really looking forward to this this morning. Carol's going to talk to us about the time she lived in Shenzhen, which is China, uh, one of China's, well, I think then it was the first, it was China's first economic, special economic zone. Um, I think there's probably been a few more since then, but Carol's going to tell us all about it. And I'm sure we're all going to learn a huge amount today. So, mm -hmm. so have, your, have your pens ready if you want to make a note. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, welcome, welcome also to those of you who will be joining us on YouTube this um, on our recorded version, which um, is proving really popular. So welcome to you. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and please subscribe to our channel. And please do look at some of the other talks as well. So over to you, Carol, um, if you'd like to say hello and share your screen. Yeah, good morning everyone. Um, just a couple of things before I start. Um, please forgive my pronunciation of the Chinese place names. I, I'll do my best. Uh, if anyone um, does know how to pronounce some of these places, please let me know. <laughs> the second thing is that any of the photographs that I have pre-2012 uh, I've got a list of internet sources, but they're mostly from shenzhenparty.com, uh, South China Daily and Wikipedia. So I'll just, uh, we'll get onto the slide show now. Good. Um, Shenzhen is China's first and most successful special economic zone. And it, it's about the size of Leicestershire. However, it has a population of between 12 and 15 million people. So it's situated in the Guangdong province, which is in southeastern China, just down here. It lies on the Pearl River Delta and it's bordered by Hong Kong to the south. Now, pre-1980, Shenzhen was a town uh, with a population of about 30,000 people. It was relatively unknown. I, I think it was probably known for one thing, and that was the train station that it had. Uh, it's still there, and it, bought, it lies right on the border between the mainland and Hong Kong. It's part of the Kowloon to Canton railway that was built in 1911. In 1980, Shenzhen was given the status of city. And later that year, it was designated as a special economic zone. Um, about three or four weeks ago, Xi Jinping was there to give a speech. He traveled about the area and it was part of the 40 year celebrations. I think were probably uh, slightly subdued celebrations this year um, on account of the, the situation at the moment in the world. I went to Shenzhen with my husband in 2012 and we were there for three months. He went there to work. And I'm pleased to be able to say that I, I was there and was able to explore. And what um, really surprised me and was how can, excuse me, every time I touch the screen to show you the point, point at the places, uh, I'm losing the picture. Um, the changes between the top two photographs and the bottom two. How can a place change so much in 40 years? I came back with lots of fond memories of Shenzhen and I wanted to know much, much more about China, about its people and about Shenzhen. Why was it chosen as a special economic zone? What is a special economic zone? And why has it been so successful? 
Uh, I can certainly answer the first two questions this morning. To answer the question of um, what is a special economic zone, you need to look a little bit at China's history. And I'm sure that you all recognize this chap, Mao Zedong, the PRC's first chairman in 1949. He was responsible for introducing the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Um, that involved collectivism and group conformity. And I, I'm sure that you all know about this history. It resulted in um, great hardship and famine for the people. And it was disastrous for the country, for the economy of the country. His death in 1976 was really the catalyst to the modernization of China. And Deng Xiaoping is often credited with being the architect of modern China. <clears throat> there were several party members, in, including Deng, who realized even before Mao died that uh, China needed to modernize. And he introduced a policy of reform and openness in 1978. That policy um, involves three different areas. So educational and agricultural reform were rolled out throughout China and they were uh, successful right from the start. However, economic reform posed a bit of a problem. In order to modernize the country and boost the economy, they knew that they needed to attract foreign investment, investment from foreign countries, i.e. Um, the Western class enemy. And whilst doing that, they also wanted to uphold their basic principles of socialism. <clears throat> um, there were several people, um, I think, well, certainly including Deng, who felt that um, it would be a good idea to create special districts. And he was in favor of creating these special districts to introduce economic reforms and much broader reforms that could be introduced into these districts that would be too controversial to be introduced into the larger well-established cities. <clears throat> Forgive all, all the writing here, but I, I couldn't quite remember everything without seeing it written down. Um, these special districts ended up becoming four small cities that were designated as special economic zones in 1980. Um, the goal was to attract foreign capital, new technologies and foreign expertise to China's export and manufacturing and processing sectors. And the method to achieve that attraction was to create these zones, to, to bring in the foreign companies into these zones. And the enticement to the investors was that within these special economic zones, they were given, the companies were given a legal of, a level of legal protection not available to Chinese companies. As you know, China has got a very, a huge population. So therefore they could offer a huge, cheap, relatively well-trained labor force. In many cases, customs were reduced and even eliminated and tax, income tax was greatly reduced uh, for these companies that were investing. And one significant thing um, within the zones was improvement to infrastructure could go ahead with, without having to go to central government for approval.
So we need to look at the geography of the area to find out why Shenzhen was chosen. The four small cities that were chosen were Jimen, which is in the Fujian province, Shantou, Zhuhai, and Shenzhen, four small coastal cities. Now, Shenzhen was chosen because, as I said, it's located on the Pearl River Delta. Here, it borders Hong Kong to the south, and it's not far. I'm so sorry. Every time I touch the pointer, it's um, moving the slides on. Shenzhen is not far from Guangzhou, and I'm sure that you will recognise the name if I say Canton. So that whole area has got a shared, not just a shared language, but also a shared dialect and a shared culture, Cantonese, with Hong Kong. Hong Kong at the time was doing very well economically. And the leaders knew full well that Hong Kong was being handed back over to China in 1997. The disparity in wealth between Hong Kong and China was, was huge. And what I've discovered is that Deng Zhou Shenzhen also to stop the illegal migration to Hong Kong. So in the late 60s and 70s, 2 million, at least 2 million people tried to illegally migrate to Hong Kong from Shenzhen. These were young adults who left their families and their friends behind and um, tried to escape to the, from the mainland. Many of them were caught and repatriated. Many of them died and are buried in the hills of Shenzhen. And those that did survive ended up working in Hong Kong and formed the backbone of the working class. I'll try it once more. Oh. If you just take a look at Shenzhen Bay on the slide there, uh, the main route, the main escape route was from this. I'm so sorry, it just, uh, not letting me show you anything. The main escape route was across Shenzhen Bay to Yuen Long, and it took four to five hours to swim across there. So I, I think people were really suffering. They were suffering from famine and great hardship um, to do that. Now let's take a look at Shenzhen city as it is now. You can see where it says Shenzhen on the photograph. That is where the original town was. Um, and of course, it's now a huge city. Because it's only 40 years old, it's got a modern infrastructure and the transport links are excellent. The main roads travel from east to west. No, it's not letting me do it. The main roads travel from east to west and they are dual carriageway, three lanes, dual carriageway. And it's very easy to travel by car. Public transport's very good. There are regular buses that will take you anywhere in Shenzhen and it's very cheap to travel. There is also a very modern metro system. Those of you who know me will know that I like to walk a lot, but when I was in Shenzhen, I traveled extensively on the metro. I did also take a couple of bus trips. Now, metro system 
is brilliant. As you can see, it's pristine. It's not always quite like this. There are guards stationed all along the platform. You can see one there in the background. And when it's busy, everybody gets on and off the uh, trains um, in a very uh, pleasant manner. There's none of this rush that you see on the London Metro. As you can see on the photograph on the left, the signs are in English and Mandarin. When you travel on the Metro, the announcements are always in Mandarin, Cantonese and English. There are lots of ticket booths and there are also, or there are also lots of ticket machines. It's quite easy to buy a ticket. Everything's in English and the tickets, it's cheap to travel wherever you go. <clears throat> now we flew from Manchester to Hong Kong and then we caught a ferry to Chicago. So let's take a look. Um, Hong Kong airport is down at the bottom of this slide. And you can just see um, at the bottom a place called Tung Chung. That's where the airport is situated. So we flew there and then we caught a ferry up to Shenzhen Bay. I'll just give you a minute to look at that. Now from Shenzhen Bay, uh, we traveled on the ferry to Sheiko Port. It's on the Nanto Peninsula, and, and that is about 20 to 30 kilometers from the city center. <clears throat> the hotel that we were staying at was less than a five minute walk from the port. And the ferry was, uh, it was a little ferry like this one. We didn't see our cases in uh, Hong Kong. We sat in a little no man's land. The cases were loaded into the containers and placed on the top of the ferry on the right hand side there. And then when we arrived at Sheko Port, we had a ticket and our luggage was uh, given to us. The Nanhai Hotel was a five star hotel. It was very, very nice. We had no complaints whatsoever. Um, it was, a nice roomy um, hotel, lots of room in the bedroom there. If anything, I think you would say it was slightly old fashioned, the dark wood everywhere. But other than that, it was, it was a brilliant place to stay. Now you can see from the hotel window, we had um, a swimming pool and tennis courts. However, it was January when we went, the weather was warm, we could walk with, without jackets on, we just wore our jackets at night. Uh, the weather was sunny every day, we had half a day's rain while we were there. So we didn't use the swimming pool at all. These are the views looking the other way from the hotel. Now on the bottom photograph, those buildings in the background are mostly residential. And you can see that the people living in those uh, flats have got wonderful views out over the bay. On the left hand photograph, you can actually see the Western territories of Hong Kong in the background. And you might also be able to make out a bridge. That is the Sheiko Bay Bridge or the Hong Kong Western Corridor. It was completed in 2007, five and a half kilometers long. It's a, there's a dual carriageway, three lane uh, on either side. And at the time it was the widest and highest standard way, standard highway bridge in China. Uh, I, I found this, uh, leaflet quite recently, and this is the Nanhai Hotel where we stayed. Um, and 
As you can see, the date is 1983, so it was probably one of the first modern hotels to, if not the first, hotel to be built in Shenzhen. And as you can see, it's in a wonderful situation. But uh, the water that you can see in the foreground here, just in front of the hotel, is no longer there. There has been a lot of land reclamation around Sheiko and around Shenzhen Bay. So that area, there's now a promenade from the hotel that goes on for miles. So you can see here that um, when we were there, they were still developing um, the, the promenade and the area adjacent to it. This is not far from the hotel. Further along, we could walk for miles along the promenade. <clears throat> this is the Nanto Peninsula and Sheko Fishing Village in the 1980s. The road that you can see on the bottom photograph is one of those main east to west roads that um, was on the one of the earlier slides one of the dual carriageway three lane roads. This area was actually giving the, given the right to be developed as an industrial area in 1979. So it was a little testing site before the designated Shenzhen as a special economic zone. There was only uh, the fishing village, not much more, a custom station and very little else in the surrounding area. Um, I think if development hadn't been successful, nobody would have known about it. However, development in that area was successful right from the start. Industrial development on the Nantau Peninsula began with investment from Hong Kong. And lots of factories were built. And this is a typical example of the factories that I would walk past. Um, the gates were always closed. There were no signs to say what the factory was or what was being made there. But I can tell you that I have an entry in my diary which tells me that in 2012, 80% of the world's artificial Christmas trees were made in Shenzhen. And three quarters of the toys that are sold in the world are made in Shenzhen. They also make lots of jewellery and clocks. Things have moved on since then, and I, I do believe that uh, now they are world leaders in artificial intelligence. Soon after um, Hong Kong began to invest in the area, foreign investors began to come into the area to um, foreign investors such as uh, Texaco and Shell, investors in oil drilling and rig service companies, and they came to tap the oil resources in the South China Seas. So this began to, uh, lots of engineers and platform workers began to, began to settle in the area. And these engineers and workers were from uh, Texas, Scandinavia and Scotland. I can't believe this, it's just frozen on me. It happens sometimes, I'm afraid. <laughs> I want to try and switch it oh, off and on again. It's it's okay. We're um good. We're okay, yeah. So Deco became the home for the majority of expats. As a result of that, um, they had to start building lots of housing. And this is one example of the residential 
housing estates that were built for the expats. Uh, you can see there are flats and then at the bottom there, there are coffee shops and restaurants. Lots of restaurants and cafes were established and lots of bars. And there are two inter international schools not far away. Now this area has got nothing to do, it's not with, a, with um, an aquatic park. Deng Xiaoping decided to call this area SeaWorld when he was there on a visit in 1984. Um, he, he, he took the name from the cruise ship that you can see in the background. This area adjacent to the cruise ship has been developed um, as an area for expats and tourists. This is the adjacent area. So th there's a large plaza and lots and lots of restaurants and uh, entertainment, things like karaoke. The restaurants would, are very familiar, Italian, Mediterranean, Mexican. So it, it has got a very Western feel to the area. <clears throat> and this is the cruise ship that you saw earlier. It's the Minghua. It was a former cruise ship. Um, when it, its working life came to an end, it was moored in, alongside the harbour in 1984 um, as a, a floating hotel. As a result of the land reclamation in the area, um, it became landlocked. When we were there, it, there was lots of restaurants open on the ship, but there was a lot of rev renovation and development going on around there. And this is what the area looks like now. So they've, um, it's been nicely landscaped, a nice water feature behind the ship there. There are several apparently very nice restaurants on the ship now. There's a water fountain on the deck and every evening there are uh, fountain displays that people can go along and watch. Um, the plaza itself hasn't changed very much, but there are a lot more shops and entertainment venues there. It has been developed quite a lot and it is very popular, not just with expats, but also with tourists. Uh, lots of tourists from China itself go to Shenzhen um, to, to, to visit and see the attractions there. Um, I'm going to leave it at this point. Um, because um, I, I feel that if anybody's got any questions, I can perhaps answer the questions for the first half. Okay, Carol, thanks for that. Thanks so much, it's so interesting. Um, someone has just put a question, Smita uh, has asked the restaurant owners, were they the original Italian owners or were they run by local Chinese people? Um, uh, there was a mixture. There, there was definitely a mixture there. The, the ones that we, we didn't dine out there very often. Uh, we did go to an Italian restaurant and there were Italians in there, but there were lots of Chinese staff. We also went into an Irish uh, pub one night. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, they are everywhere. I don't know if it's still there, but again, there were English people there. Um, what I found when I was there, we did meet a lot of Americans. And when I was out through the day exploring, I, I did meet um, a lady who had taught at one of the international schools. She was from America and had taught at one of the schools there. Uh, in the hotel, there were lots of people from Texas and um, the company that my husband was working for, there were several 
uh, people from the company staying in the hotel. So people from all over the world. Uh, but definitely also lots of uh, people from Glasgow were in the hotel. But um, it, it, it is the expat area. There weren't the expats settled in Shenzhen. And, and I think really in that area, a lot of people could speak English. The further I went into the city centre, the fewer people that could speak English. And I mean, why should they? Um, I believe since about 2013, 14, um, because more people in China are learning English at the universities, um, more of the expats were moving into the city centre than previously. Could I ask, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Carol, could I ask, where you, one thing I can't see in this picture, pretty as it is, are no green spaces, and I wonder if they had parks or gardens. Uh, yeah. Or open yeah. areas, you know, and flowers and trees and wildlife and birds and yeah. little mice and hedgehogs and that's not hedgehogs, but you know, little mammals. Yeah, interestingly, you don't see, you haven't seen much on, on the photographs here. There are lots of nice green spaces. You will see a couple of them in the, in the later slides. Um, it is, it is uh, very, very built up, but they do make lots of effort to, um, to put lots of green spaces there to, you know, the streets, uh, you can see that there are trees here lining the streets and oh, that yeah. was everywhere. Yeah. Um, the, there is a park not far from this area that I used to go to. I don't think I've got any pictures of that, but the, there are lots of lovely green spaces and lots and there were lots and lots of flowers. Even oh. um, as you walked along the promenade, um there was there were small parks with lots of beautiful flowers and there were there were flowering in in january oh. so it's not just a concrete jungle well that's good that, that no, no you can see the trees there can't you i mean it, it doesn't it does look as if there is plenty of greenery um <clears throat> right why were all five special economic zones cited in one province in such a vast country, do you know? Um, I know a little bit about it. I think they were chosen because um, they were a long way from Beijing. They, they were small coastal cities. I mean, you know, Shenzhen wasn't even a city and, until a few months beforehand. Um, they were close to Hong Kong, and as the leaders knew, Hong Kong was being handed back over to China in 1997. And there was, as I said, Hong Kong were doing very well economically, and there was a huge disparity in wealth between the mainland and Hong Kong. I think it had to do with logistical um, um, reasons because they were on the coast and that area had more had had more contact with foreign countries in the past uh, certainly the area around Shenzhen around Hong Kong if we look back at history and the opium wars and uh, what happened at the time um, the ports along that coast had been open certainly the um, they were more familiar with foreign countries along there um, Hong Kong also the port was already working well there, there were um, it was up and running for imports and exports which the ports around that coast at the time weren't um, 
as well equipped to do to deal with it. And of course, the whole idea was to um, bring in foreign industries. So I, th I think that's the main reason. Yeah, they were okay. a long way from central government. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I wonder. Somebody said, I guess everything is well maintained and clean. But uh, yeah, I mean, when when you you perhaps see from the the pictures in this second half, it is a nice clean country, and uh, in the city centre, it, it's it is well maintained. But yeah. you know, like it's like anywhere, there are one or two areas. Some of the older buildings. Um, and what happened when Shenzhen was built, many of the villages and towns were razed to the ground, but a lot of them survived within the city and they've become known as urban villages. And when you go to those urban villages, uh, little side streets and, and particular areas, um, it's different. It's, it, it's quite run down in places. Yeah, thanks for that, Carol. Anyway, I think we'll perhaps we'll let you go to part two, shall we? And then yeah. I'll look I'll look back at this time at the end. Yeah. Okay. So I'm um, I'm going to start the second half with a little look at food. Um, as I said, this area is um, Cantonese, so. Um, Dumplings and tea is a Cantonese meal, and this was outside a restaurant. Uh, here you can see some of the staff making dumplings. It's very, very popular in Shenzhen. Cantonese squab is um, a very nice dish. It's roasted pigeon uh, cooked in the Cantonese style and um, you would you find Cantonese squab in a in a restaurant like this, which is very very nice, isn't it? From the outside, when you just look at the this area up here, it's a fabulous little restaurant. Just as anywhere in China and Asia, you see lots of these um, places where you can buy steamed corn or steamed sweet potato or you know lots of different things uh, there were always these little kiosks selling uh, a variety of Chinese teas for takeaway <clears throat> there were lots of uh, fruit stalls food was certainly uh, in abundance, no sign nowadays of famine and hard, not the hardship that people suffered in the 70s. Lots and lots of food, a huge variety of uh, fruit on the stalls there. And also um, stalls selling lots of vegetables. Most of them are recognized. There were one or two that I, I wasn't familiar with. And if you just note in the background over to the left there is uh, the meat market or the wet market. Now, I haven't put any photographs in of that market, but I can tell you that they were selling live chickens. And you could take a chicken home under your arm live or they would kill it for you on the spot and dip it into a, a tub of boiling water and pluck it for you. Um, in 2014, the live chicken mar markets were supposed to have been prohibited. I don't really think that um, it stopped everywhere. Something else that was on sale in Shenzhen was dog meat. Now, apparently it's a meat that um, is eaten in the winter in Shenzhen. However, I did read that around about April, May time this year, Shenzhen have prohibited the slaughter and the sale of cat and dog meat. 
so uh, with regard to the chickens, that was a result of bird flu. And obviously with regard to the, uh, the dogs, this is a direct result of, of COVID. Charging oysters were in abundance um, in Shenzhen and they are very, very popular. They are cultivated in the waters around the peninsula, um, in the, the waters of the Pearl River Delta. And here you can see this, this boat's absolutely full of oysters. Now, I think at this point, I would say that this, the second half of my talk um, is aimed to give you a look at the contrast of life in Shenzhen. Shenzhen's known for its Shenzhen speed, the speed with which the city has grown, the speed with which the um, tall buildings have been erected, and the speed with which some people live their lives. But what I found was a city of, of great contrast, uh, really multifaceted, just like any city anywhere in the world. Um, Shaojing oysters have been cultivated in and around, uh, well, in the waters around Shenzhen for thousands of years. So for a lot of people in the area, life just goes on. Um, they live their lives, go to work and enjoy their spare time when they can. I hope these next photographs can just demonstrate that. Take a look at the jetty in the foreground. Um, despite all the technology in Shenzhen, it's quite obvious that this has been made by the people uh, working around here. And it's made of bamboo, um, lots of wooden planks, and it, they look like oil drums to me. And here you can see some chaps fishing at the same time. When we were there, the oysters were particularly good. Apparently they are plumper and juicier. Uh, in early winter, when the, the days are warm and the evenings are cool. There's just a, another look at people around the harbour. You can see our hotel in the background. And um, the, the, the bay. It became obvious that a lot of people are still working on the boats and also living on them. It, it was really nice um, walking around that area, um, walking along the promenade and listening to these boats just chugging along across the water. And you can see somebody's got their washing hanging up on this one. Hong Kong in the background. And uh, I, I think one of the questions may have been about bicycles, despite the fact that there are lots of um, well-built roads, there are still many, many people who travel around on their bicycles. And again, these chaps are just having a, a nice, enjoyable time, uh, break time at the harbour. I do like to people watch. Again, it doesn't matter where they are, whether they're outside a shop or in the park. Uh, many of them like to play mahjong. There were lots and lots of um, areas where there were shops like this, um, separate little shops where you could buy material, uh, suits, um, wares for the home, cushions and, and uh, anything that you needed for the home, lots of tiny little shops. This one was a hardware shop. A colleague of my husband's, he asked his wife to go and get him uh, some step ladders and she got them in this shop here. 
And some of the buildings are quite nice, actually, despite uh, the fact that there are such a lot of high rises in Shenzhen. I quite like this one with the, the curvy roof. And we've got a slight problem again. So it's just frozen on me, so bear with me. Um, I'll just wait a minute and see if, if, uh, okay. if I can work it in a moment. But um, you, just looking at this uh, slide, these are workers' flats and uh, local people's flats. And you can see the washing hanging up there. Uh, it's just gone complex. Ah, right. Um, and sometimes uh, I would walk along the streets and, and you would see individuals selling whatever they could. Um, they look like uh, cherries. But um, I would often see people just sat on the street uh, selling whatever they, they had. Now, I guess with the, the influx of uh, foreign companies and people from America, you know, lots of Texans settling there, it was inevitable that um, companies like Walmart go to China. Walmart was one of the first big international brands to enter China and it went to Shenzhen first. There were several Walmart, Walmarts uh, and they're, they're dotted about all over China now. The Americans want it both ways, don't they? They want to try with They don't. Yeah. Um, Recently, Walmart, uh, it was a, an article that I read about a Walmart in Shanghai. And they've been accused of not catering to the Chinese taste. However, I'm not quite sure that I would agree with that. Um, the Chinese like everything to be fresh, uh, as you know, chickens and also fish. And I think Walmart was certainly catering to, to the, the Chinese. Um, this lady had collected lots of shrimp in that plastic bag. She got them weighed, filled, the assistant filled the bag with water and she took them home alive. And it didn't matter what size the fish was, it was on sale in Walmart in fish tanks. I have to say the tanks were very clean. It, it looked, the fish looked uh, healthy. There were lots of uh, bob, deep bobs full of rock salt, seaweed salt, rock sugar, and lots of dried um, foods on display. So I guess just like uh, we experienced it um, years ago with the influx of supermarkets more and more people will start to shop in places like Walmart. But this area Dongmen is um, it was established 300 years ago as the center of Shenzhen market so the, the two photographs on the left the black and white photographs show Dongmen in the 1980s, you can see even then it was a very busy place. And McDonald's, I guess again, it was inevitable that McDonald's would be attracted to the mainland. The first McDonald's arrived in China in Dongmen in 1990. I went there, um, to one of the McDonald's on a couple of occasions. And I have to say it was so easy. You just point to a picture and you can get whatever you want. And it was really, really cheap. It probably cost me about 50 pence for a McDonald's meal at the time. This area, the streets around this area are still busy shopping streets and you can buy anything 
on the streets of Dongmen. Shenzhen is known as a fake city. So you can buy anything there, uh, Gucci, Ray-Ban glasses, anything that you can think of um, for a very cheap price. And if you ask the vendors, is this a fake? They will tell you in all honesty that yes, it is. Some of them are very, very good fakes, um, but I, I do think you have to be careful. Now, in complete contrast to the uh, shopping that we've seen in the earlier slides, this is a shopping mall in Huhai. Uh, there were lots of high-end shopping malls in the city centre, well, all over the city. And it was when I came to this shopping mall that I really did ask myself, is China really a communist country? because this place just exuded wealth. There were lots of um, high-end shops selling, uh, well, just like any, any shopping mall in this country, but um, very expensive shops. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, it's very nice, isn't it? This is a hairdresser's. Um, to me, all it says is bling, but it certainly, um, again, caters, the whole place to me catered for people with money. What I discovered was it isn't really um, aimed towards the locals. The shopping mall is in intended to entice tourists from elsewhere in China, expats and day shoppers from Hong Kong day shoppers go across and uh, for the day and for a, a spending spree because it's much cheaper to buy in Shenzhen than it is in Hong Kong. Having said that, I, I do think that that disparity um, between prices has probably narrowed even more um, since I was there. Shopping malls were usually four or five storeys high and on the top floor you would often find a kiddies play area. And on the bottom floor, very often there would be a skating rink or some, somewhere for people to enjoy themselves. So it was great to look down from the, the upper floors and see everybody having a really nice time skating. Now, Hilda asked me earlier about uh, greenery and flowers. Most, I would say all of the, the roads, the main roads were lined with trees. So it was quite green wherever you went. And uh, within all of these high rises, wherever I went, you would find landscaped areas. So this on the left here, you've got a nice, um, canal and lots of nice flowers and on the right hand side here this this large area in between all of these uh, tower blocks and it, it is it does look lovely doesn't it and when you get closer to at this uh, particular one there was an allotment now I don't know if this allotment belonged to a family or whether it, it was a, a collective, but it, it was nice to stay within such a built up area. Two thousand and twelve was Chinese New Year, Year of the Dragon. Uh, I know that you you will all have seen uh, decorations for Chinese New Year. The one on the left hand side there was in that uh, shopping mall. And the one on the right here is outside um, a residential block, a, a complex. 
and Langton's on a, on a bridge here. But there were uh, three or four that really caught my eye. And this, this was something that caught my eye in uh, a shopping mall. Um, dragons and the color red are very auspicious. So 2012 was an extremely auspicious year, year of the dragon. And um, this just it exudes wealth to me. It, it was beautiful. It was also extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. so. This photograph did not do this uh, model justice. You've got two red dragons here and they have been built out of uh, Coca-Cola cans. So it puts a, a new slant on recycling. This was very nice. Um, I'm not sure if this was the entrance to a shopping mall or a, um, a cinema, but you can see that the dragon's tail goes all the way through the pedestrian area. And I just thought that was really, really nice to see. And now we're back in Walmart. Several shops were recommending people to buy red wear but not only to buy it, but to wear red underwear for the whole of the year because it was a really auspicious year and it would bring you lots of luck. Now we're in the heart of Shenzhen, right in the heart of the city. And as you can see, there are well, there's a plethora of um, high rise buildings, but here we have the Civic Centre that was uh, completed in 2004. It was designed by a, a Chinese American and the roof of the Civic Centre is meant to represent the wings of the rock, the mythical bird of prey. And I just think that th this building is absolutely fabulous. Um, the surrounding area is, is beautiful. You can see um, lots of greenery, um, different shaped buildings. It was a real pleasure to see this within the city centre. The building houses a museum, historical archives, government offices and a conference room for two and a half thousand people. It also had a super dining room where all the workers went to have their lunch and um, I was taken there by a, an American teacher and we had dumplings and tea and it was delicious. It also has in the basement an absolutely enormous model of Shenzhen. Now, if, if you think about the wings on the top of the building and you come to one end, this is looking at one of the wings from the side and this is where the museum is situated. The museum is well worth a visit and I went there on two occasions. There are 20,000 cultural relics. You can learn all about the history of China. There are several floors and on each floor, a different topic is discussed, but you, you can learn all about China's history. Uh, it tells you about the formation of the People's Republic of China. And it also tells you about the history of Shenzhen. These displays took my eye. Um, the dragon dance, which is um, often see the dragon dance in China. And uh, we saw it in Singapore whenever a new shop was opened, a new Chinese shop. And the, the bottom one um, was talking about the Lantern Festival. And if you look at the chaps at the bottom, they look very real, don't they? But they, they're models but it was a really nice display. 
wherever you go in Shenzhen, if you see a group of girls, certainly my experience was that they came and asked me to take their photograph with their phone and then asked me to take a photograph of them on my phone. Not far from the museum is Book City. Now, I looked for a bookshop when I was in Shenzhen. I kept looking for bookshops and this is the only bookshop that I found. However, it's uh, state owned, as I believe most of them are, or the majority. And it's apparently the world's largest bookstore with over 3 million books. And it is open 24 hours a day. And it has some nice restaurants and coffee shops where you can go and, and relax and uh, read. And what I can say is that they don't import very much, very many books from other countries. They did have some copies of uh, the magazines Time and The Economist, Times and Economist. And apparently, if you can read Chinese, there were one or two books that um, covered the politics of Hong Kong and Taiwan, which I found quite surprising. This photograph doesn't really do justice to what I saw because when I was in that bookshop, there were people sitting everywhere. Every seat was full. They were sitting on any open space they could find. They were sitting on the stairs reading. Everybody was absorbed reading books and magazines. It was really good to see. Uh, and here you can see some young children looking at books as well. And they, they, they had um, books for sale. And apparently they also had an opticians. State-owned bookshops in China apparently always have an opticians um, beside them or within them. Now we're coming on to Concert Hall, which again wasn't far from there. When we were there, Take That were booked to play at Concert Hall. We didn't go and see them, but um, there were adverts all over to say that they were, were performing. This building was completed in 2008 and uh, was designed by a Japanese architect, Arata. Izozaki. As you can see, it had a symphony hall with over 1,500 seats, rehearsal rooms, recording studios, and an outdoor music square. It looks nice on the inside, but it's absolutely fabulous on the inside. You can see there in the background on the left hand side that there's a pipe organ. It's the only one in Shenzhen. But I, I just think that this hall is absolutely fabulous. The acoustics apparently are really, really good. And the people of Shenzhen are encouraged um, to um, go and um, listen to the classical music. Um, they try to open classical music up for everyone. So lots of residential districts, people in communities are invited to go on a Saturday and um, various performers will perform for these residents. They also have beautiful Sundays. Anybody can go to the concert hall on beautiful Sunday and uh, you're treated to a free performance from three o'clock onwards. Now, 
Now, in that whole city centre area on a weekend, not, not only are people invited to go and, and um, become familiar with uh, classical music, the children can also go and um, partake in storytelling activities in the bookstore. And then lots and lots of people just have a really good time outside. All age groups, you can see young lads there break dancing. These ladies were practicing to music, practicing exercise and dancing to music. You can see these young children were learning to paint the Chinese characters. Uh, the, the brushes there were dipped in water. And this chap was showing them how to do it. All ages were created for very young children. And here at the bottom, we've got some kiddies on rollerblades. Wherever you get people outside enjoying themselves for the day uh, and lots of tourists, you also get street hawkers selling their wares. And this is the entrance to Kite Park. The, the kites are, are just lots, variety of kites, and people would go into the park, and there were, there were hundreds and hundreds of people in this park flying their kites. There you can see some of the kite, kites up in the, in the background there. There was another entrance to the, there was also a lake with boats, and the other entrance, um, was very nice. There were lots of nice flowers. Uh, it was a, a well tended garden. Um, well, th this was this was quite in. Well, I thought it was interesting. Um, unfortunately, I won't be showing you any flowers. But um, I'd heard that there was a petrified forest at Fairy Lake Botanical Park. And I, I desperately wanted to go and see it. So I caught a bus and it took me an hour and a half to get there. And then when I got to the park, I realized that this wasn't just any park. Um, it was 590 hectares. There was, it was a botanical garden with scientific research. There were lots of plant species there, orchids and desert <coughs> plants, aquatic plants and palms. There was a huge variety of uh, plants and flowers. But I went with one very specific aim and that was to see the fossilized forest. Now, when I arrived there, there were, lot, there were lots of little buses. Oh, I won't show you. You can see a, a couple of blue buses in the background and they were there to take people around but I opted to walk. So this is the entrance and you can see, you can see the blue buses in the background, but I, I opted to, to walk. And um, what I discovered was this park reminded me very much of the Lake District. If you're familiar with the Lake District, you'll know exactly what I mean, because there was a, a narrow road that just took you up and up and up and up. Lots of uh, bends, a really windy road. And this is part way up. And you can just see the lake in the background. And it's at the foot of the Wutong Mountain. The views were to die for. Now, one of the things that people visit this area for is to visit the Hong Fa Temple. Thousands of uh, monks and Buddhists go to see this temple every year. Uh, the lake is, mm. is huge. It's, it's beautiful. Um, there are boats in the background there, so you could go on a boat ride. Um, this is why I went. What I was expecting was an in-situ fossil forest, but it wasn't. 
there were 800 petrified trees in this area and they were from all over the world. Uh, for example, in Mongolia, I've got them all written down here, Leoning, America, Indonesia, South Africa, Madagascar. Um, and they'd all been placed in this garden. I think uh, Feng Shui comes to mind, but it was just fabulous to see it. There was a, a museum close by that contains lots of animal and plant fossils. There it is. It, mm -hmm. it, it was just fabulous to see it. Mm -hmm. um, on the way down, it, it, I have to say, it took me, I was nearly ready for going home when I found that fossil forest. Uh, on the way down, that was the, the picture on the right there is the only view that I had of rural China the whole time that I was in Shenzhen. I expected to see uh, lots of rural China and of course Shenzhen isn't like that but there it was uh, and it was the last day before it was the day before we were going home. The only other thing I was going to talk about, if, if I've got time, is um, yeah. a couple of museums that I, I visited. I love Chinese art. Um, and I went to two museums. One is this He Jianing Modern Art Museum. And it was the first art museum to be named after a person in China. And this lady is a fascinating lady. She was uh, a politician, a painter, a poet and a feminist and she organised China's first rally for International Women's Day in 1924. Um, born in, in 1878 she was a lady who should have had her feet bound but she was born into quite a, a, a rich family and she refused to have her feet bound. I, I thought, you know, she was a, a woman ahead of her time. Yeah. In 1998, these three stamps were issued, postage stamps, and each one um, shows one of her paintings, uh, simply called Lion, Tiger and Plum Blossom. Now in that mm -hmm. museum, all the signs were in English. It was really easy to walk around and read all about this lady. However, in this art museum, it was a different story. Guan Shanye is another very well-known artist in China. So that's the museum there. And he was a traditional Chinese ink painter. He travelled all over China and uh, he, he travelled quite extensively throughout the world. He donate, donated 813 of his artworks to help fund this museum. Uh, there is a collection of his works in New York at the Metropolitan Museum. And I have to say, I just loved his paintings. I've only got two there that you can only just see, but his paintings were just fabulous. Yeah, and can you, can you see them? Thanks. Yeah. Yes. On the left-hand side, that is the only English sign that I saw in the museum. Um, so what I did, I took a couple of photographs and photographed that and then had a good look at all of his paintings and then went home and, and um, did some research because I, I just think his artwork is, is fabulous. Two things that I took home from there is, if you go somewhere and you know, you're in a place and it, you're, you can't see your own language anywhere, don't be put off, do what I did, have a good look, take some photographs and then do your research afterwards. And the other thing is, um, 
there's been a sea change since the days of Mao Zedong because China now, certainly in Shenzhen, they are starting to celebrate um, their own history. And, you know, museums like this that are showing the artworks of people that have been important in their own history. People aren't afraid now to take an interest in, in their culture. And um, I thought that was a really um, good thing to take home from China. Mm. In part one, I have put up under the chat screen. So if, you're, if you've already heard this, I apologize, but I asked about why all five um, special economic zones happen to be in such a small area in such a huge country. Um, and whether it was a political response to a political and economic response to Hong Kong being so close. And I don't know whether uh, Carol had a chance to answer that or if indeed she knows. Uh, I, I, I was able to answer it. Um, the, the limited knowledge that I have. I mean, you're absolutely bang on when you mention Hong Kong. They, they, they were aware of the fact that Hong Kong was being handed back over in 1997. So uh, they, they chose those cities, it was strategic. They, the cities, well, they weren't actually cities. I mean, they were, they were, Shenzhen and Shantou were certainly towns that were given city status, but um, they were a long way from Beijing was one of the reasons. Uh, and they were close to Hong Kong and they had that area, that region had had more contact with foreign countries in the past. Oh, thank you. So uh, there aren't any others in any other part of China? <coughs> there's, there's, another, uh, there's another one. Um, there's another special economic zo zone um, I can't quite remember where it is. It's, it's, it's not that far away from there. Hainan is also a special economic zone. But then they, in 1984, they created 14 coastal cities. Now these, they work like special economic zones, but they, they, they weren't designated in the same way. So there are differences in how they work. I, I really don't know what the difference is, but they're, right. they're called open cities. But they've also developed lots of different types of economic zones. There are three or four different types now. Um, right. They started on the coast and then they've moved inland. So if you think about the the new railway that it's running that follows the length of the silk route mm -hmm. this is part of the development inland now first of all they went um into the river cities the cities near the big rivers and now they've they're going further inland and um improving the infrastructure you know by building this this railway is one right. of the things that they're doing. Thank you, thanks. I hope that answers your question. Yes, I, it does, you know, thank yes. you, but it um, also gives me material for further research, which I need to do.